Welcome, my friends, to Digital Disconnect. I am your host, Scott Ritzema, and I have the joy of presenting our 13th message, the last one in the series. And this one is maybe going to be the most challenging for some of us. It's digital detox. We're going to make some decisions today of some kind. And I have the privilege and joy with my wife in Michigan of running a little ministry with a small team. We're called Belt of Truth Ministries, and we share newsletters periodically. I hold in my hands one of my favorite stories that I've ever heard and ever shared, and I, we pass this on via email newsletter. I want to share it with the 3ABN audience as well as we begin the question of a family media fast. So let's begin with prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege of knowing Jesus. We pray that the decisions that we make as we're confronted by challenging information and conviction by your Holy Spirit, that we would come out of that knowing you better and finding greater joy in the experience you've, in, you've created for us to live. We trust you. We love you. We know that you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it begins... On a pretty dark note, Anisha, the mother, was desperate. She had two children, a third on the way, her oldest son getting detention all the time in school, 10 years old, and plagued with dark thoughts of even violence against his own family. The daughter, age seven, in an even worse state. Her mother wrote to us, it's frightening for me to read her feelings of hurt and frustration Anisha noted, the mother noted, as she was reading her daughter's journal entry one day. They were deeply morbid thoughts for a seven-year-old, too horrible for anyone to have at any age. Anisha considered admitting her daughter to a hospital, but prayer was her chosen refuge, and during the most troublesome times, she wrote to us and said, all I can do is hold her tight and pray. Anisha didn't know where to turn for help. Knowing of parenting and media seminars, she decided to reach out to me via email with the plea, I hope and pray it's not too late for us. Well, I assured her it is most definitely not too late. We set her up on the video channel, beltoftruth.tv, and she began watching the seminars. I advised her, you're going to do a trial, do a test run of a whole different way of doing life with the whole family. Focus immense attention on that daughter and the son specifically for three weeks you're going to eliminate screen time completely if you take this challenge on be outside literally as much as possible commit to a whole food plant-based diet for the time spend lots of quality time together and all of this is to be bathed in spiritual themes of joy and peace and prayer for the power of the holy spirit I recommended the family follow the strict three-week media fast prescribed by psychiatrist Dr. Victoria Dunkley in her book, Reset Your Child's Brain. You might remember we referred to the findings of this researcher and practitioner where she's treated hundreds of children with previously diagnosed disorders of various kinds, from depression to anxiety to attention problems to disruptive moods. And she's found that taking them off media for three weeks and putting them on better things like nature and real stuff and relationships relationships and eye contact, she finds 80% of her patients have the majority of their symptoms to disappear. What, what, an, what an amazing thing. So we're going to try this. We went over some examples of, of specific nighttime routines you could try since that's a troubling time in this family, a troublesome time of day where these really dark things come in. Since most people are aware there is an enemy out there, Satan, the adversary, and we are in a struggle against, not against flesh and blood, but against these principalities and powers of darkness. We recommended that they cleanse their house of CDs, DVDs, anything of the world that the enemy might claim to gain a foothold to disturb these little children. Most importantly, I encouraged her to keep on praying. Keep on praying for and with your children. And my wife and I began praying for Anisha and her family as well. She was determined. It would be difficult, she said. And aside from being in the middle of her third pregnancy, she also worked nights. But she took the advice seriously. She wanted to change. She wanted her family to change. She wrote to us, I'm still struggling and I won't give up. But I will claim God's power. Three weeks later, I received an email after the end of the three-week media fast. Anisha had kept a daily diary during this trial time. 
During that time, she and her daughter had planted tomato seeds, the family had attended camp meetings, and there were a whole, there was a whole new schedule for nighttime. She even changed her work routine to be with the children at bedtime. And at the end of the three weeks, get this, neither child was even asking for their media. Definite changes were underway, and this fast was becoming a new way of life in this home. On one occasion, soon after this, the children were misbehaving while they were supposed to be finishing some chores. Yeah, we all have been there. Anisha, with her hands full of dishes, unwashed, presently announced that she would be dishing out a serious punishment, one that the children would not soon forget. And the children began yelling and crying, but Anisha, instead of lashing out, only prayed silently. And in reality, she had no idea what punishment she would give. She'd been working on not correcting the children in anger. The media fast helps with that too. Then suddenly, as she was praying, it came to her. Their punishment would be to hug and kiss each other every morning and evening for the next seven days. Just as Romans 12 verse 21 says, Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Anisha ended the email to us with this. I'm so excited and I can't wait to see what God will continue to show me when I seek him first. The next day, Anisha found a piece of paper with her daughter's handwriting taped to the wall. It was a prayer to her heavenly father, one of repentance for their misbehavior the previous day, a prayer for a new heart and a prayer for her family members. Make me a servant, humble and meek, she wrote. Through eliminating media, incorporating nature, and plenty of family togetherness, God was transforming this family in a matter of weeks. A few months later, Anisha is now the mother of three beautiful children. Both parents continue to spend more quality time with their children. Media addictions are history, and this family is now working together as a unit, as a whole. Her son not only has stopped receiving detentions in school, but he is now known as an attentive and cooperative student. One fellow church member even noted, your son has made a 150% turnaround in just a few months. That's divine math right there, 150%. As for her once troubled daughter, she's now a happy child. She wants to be baptized. She feels loved like she's never felt loved before. And she feels love for her parents. Mommy, I love you to God's throne and back, she recently exclaimed. Anisha and her daughter now pray together from a place of calm, not crisis. And praise God, this newest baby will be well-loved at home with his mother without anyone exposing this baby to the harmful media of childhood. We're continuing to see improvements, Anisha wrote, and still persevering. Through the tempting discouragements, the failures, the struggles, the negative thoughts, Anisha continued to walk with God and cling to his promises. And he has only begun to show her and her family the blessings bestowed when we follow his way for our lives. So may you also walk in that same light. There is a light in this darkness, and that light is named Jesus. That is an encouraging story. And so many things we could discuss from just that one experience, right? I mean, how about the part when they cleansed their home? of the worldly influences, because this is a dark thing, and many people might not see that violent of a manifestation in their lives of demonic oppression, but we might have temptation, discouragement, distraction, just darkness and a cloud around us that we're not even aware of, and when we remove the things of Satan from our lives, it brings light and angelic peace into our homes. You know, James 4, verse 8 says that we can resist the devil and he will flee from us, but I heard a, pastor from a, pa a story from a pastor one time that made me think about that verse, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The pastor got on an airplane and was discussing with the man next to him what they do for work. Oh, hey, what's your name? What do you do for work? Oh, I'm a pastor. What do you do for work? Oh, I practice witchcraft. What? How do you make a living doing that? So he's sitting next to a practicing witch, a male witch, and he says, how do you make a living? And they go, well, the most common way is we arrange adulterous affairs, actually. A, a man who wants a certain lady who is married, he will pay us and get the lady to leave her husband and go with him. What a diabolical thing to do for a living. But um, this, the, he says, you know, we, we, we do make good money. We do it regularly. And the pastor says, you know, I'll just say something. You wouldn't be able to affect my marriage because my wife and I are Christians. Oh, well, now it's on. The witch says to him, we actually get Christians all the time. 
Okay, um, well, that may be, but uh, I can promise you we have the power of Jesus Christ. And in his name, you would not be able to touch my wife and I. The witch says, well, I've heard that before, but let me ask you a few questions. He proceeds to ask the pastor some very specific and pointed questions, mostly about the media use of he and his wife. What kind of things are you guys watching? What kind of videos do you have in the home? What kind of music do you listen to? What kind of reading material is your wife indulge in? Any of the trashy novels and the, you know, People magazine type of entertainment stuff. And praise God, this pastor was able to go down the litany and the list and say, you know, we've eliminated worldliness. We, we have uh, 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 videos that we watch that are uplifting and spiritual and good and true. Um, books, wonderful, good books, inspiring books. Of course, the Bible being most prominent, the book of books. Um, we don't have any of those things that you mentioned in our home. Well, now the witch says to him, it's a true story. He says, well, then you're right. We wouldn't be able to touch you. So resist the devil and he will flee from you has a prerequisite, doesn't it? What's in James chapter 4, verse 7? Right before verse 8 that says resist the devil and he will flee from you. It says submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We got to get the whole package. We can't dabble in the world and be aligned with Satan in some ways and then expect the power and peace and presence of Jesus in other ways. We say no to the world. We touch no unclean thing, God says, and I will receive you. And that doesn't mean we str don't struggle. A righteous man may fall seven times. We messed up. I raised my voice or uh, got upset or uh, I, I slipped and fell in some way. And God, please forgive me. And he will take you right back up. And his grace is sufficient for you. But we are not committed. We are not trying to serve two masters. We are not dabbling with one foot in the kingdom of Satan and one in the kingdom of heaven. That's not possible because Satan makes his claims and God says you cannot serve two masters. Either you will love the one and despise the other, hate the one and be devoted to the other. Now, um, when it comes to the things in our homes, this, this uh, older gentleman didn't need to deal with the question of video games. It wasn't a pitfall for him, but... You know, I heard an interesting statement from one Jonathan who was quoted in the book PlayStation Nation. Jonathan became a college student, had been addicted to media, and was interviewed as a part of the research for this book. And what Jonathan said was advice to mothers, to parents. They asked him, what would you say to parents with kids in the home today? He had been allowed to play, uh, you know, a certain amount of video games and got into the addiction. He says, get rid of it completely, entirely. I wish my mom had done that. Even if you limit the actual playing time, you're not going to eliminate the kids thinking about it as long as it's in the house. Don't ask, are video games okay? Just rather ask, is it the best use of time and money? And what can we doing, be doing as a family that's better? Oh, that's good stuff. Good advice from Jonathan, a college student who'd been there and done that. So how do we gain the victory over addictions and habits? And how do we do these fasts? One of the things that we've got to do is healthy living. That gives power to the brain to overcome temptation. It's universally recognized that the health of the mind is dependent on the health of the body. In fact, I have a quotation that I want to share with you that says, the reason the youth have so little strength of brain and muscle is because they do so little in the line of useful labor. Exercise, they're not exercising. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, it says in Ezekiel. Sodom, remember Sodom and Gomorrah? They, were, they had pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. She did not, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. This is the sin of Sodom. When you end up in, in, in sexual sin or any habits and any self-deprecating types of destructive behavior, it's partly you heard fullness of bread and idleness and pride and not caring about the poor. But thinking about exercise, and you know, there are a bunch of benefits of exercise. May I bullet point them for you? Exercise improves mood. Exercise lowers stress. It lowers depression. Lowers anxious feelings. Increases brain power. Increases energy levels. We're going to need that to overcome, aren't we? Increases sleep. A single exercise reduces tension, depression, anger, and confusion. This is all based on research. A 10-minute walk yields one hour of increased energy and reduced, reduced tension. Exercise is used in the treatment of fatigue. Moderate intensity exercise is better than in high intensity exercise to reduce anxious thoughts. 
Regular exercisers have fewer stress hormones released when, when stress occurs. Exercisers are less lonely, shy, and hopeless. Exercise increases a sense of self-worth. Exercise increases cerebral blood flow, increases the avail availability of neurotransmitters, and affects brain structure in a good way. Exercise improves executive function, yes, the, the prefrontal cortex. Exercise activates chemical changes in the brain that allow for greater learning and memory. So we're learning new habits. Remember, Overcoming habits is not so much stopping something as it is starting something new, and exercise will help you start all those new things, and exercise can be one of those new things that you are doing. New habits, a new way of doing life. Remember the story of Anisha. It was we're rewriting the way we do life in general, not just removing media, but we're adding all sorts of wonderful things. But speaking of simple physiological things we can do. Listen to this from Dr. John Rady in A User's Guide to the Brain. He says, critics sometimes claim that a focus on ordinary measures like exercise and diet is too simplistic to affect unordinary behavior like overcoming habits. He says, not so. The brilliantly simple evidence from exciting new areas of physical and social science shows how powerful such universal factors, exercise and diet, can be in affecting the brain body system. There are many tools right at our fingertips for changing our mental health, both in correcting our problems and simply becoming the kind of person we want to be. So even secular the scientific authorities are saying the same thing about exercise. And he mentioned diet. Oh, dare we touch that one. Don't talk about what I put on my plate. Oh, this one, we, we struggle with this one, don't we? But you know, if we can overcome appetite, we'll have the mental and spiritual and immoral power to overcome anything that we face, won't we? Listen to this quotation from Mind, Character, and Personality. In overeating or in partaking of improper articles of food, the, this indulgence, speaking of the, the immoral indulgences of sexual lusts, strengthens the animal propensities and blunts the nobler sentiments of the mind. Overeating befogs the brain. It does things to the brain that make it harder to make good choices to overcome the carnal nature. Irregular eating, irregular sleeping, not having set times of the day that we do these things also has the same effect. Now I want to quote from page 235 of Mind, Character, and Personality, an excellent book on these things from long ago. It says, it cannot be too often repeated that whatever is taken into the stomach affects not only the body, but ultimately the mind as well. Gross and stimulating food fevers the blood, excites the nervous system, and too often dulls the moral perceptions, so that reason and conscience are overborne by the sensual impulses. It is difficult and often well nigh impossible for one who is intemperate, intemperate in diet to exercise patience and self-control. Those are some strong words right there about if we're overeating, eating unhealthfully, it's going to take its toll on our ability to make good choices. So what kind of good food choices can we make? We all know what bad food is. We don't even need to say it. We're not thinking about the bad food. We're focusing on the new thing we want to become compulsively interested in, the new addiction. We can be addicted and do a new pathway. How about a good quality breakfast? High fiber, grains and fruits and nuts. Mm, that's good stuff. Did you know that people who eat a high fiber breakfast are found to be more productive, they think more clearly, and they have fewer cognitive difficulties? That is a good piece of news right there. There's a quotation, another quotation I want to share with you. The influence of Unhealthy food is to excite and strengthen the lower passions and has a tendency to deaden the moral powers. Grains and fruits, though, and vegetables and nuts and seeds and legumes prepared free from grease and in as natural a condition as possible should be the food for the tables of all who claim to be preparing for translation to heaven. The less feverish the diet, the more easily can the passions be controlled. So you're getting the idea of Quality brain food is these complex carbohydrates and good nutrition for the brain are going to give us the power to overcome the habits of media use. 
There was a science publication called The Annals of Neurology. And in this one, they looked at some of the you know, butter and, and, and red meat and these kind of things we put in our bodies. And they found that those types of fats reduced cognitive scores in the people that were eating those versus people who were eating nuts and avocados and even olive oil. They were performing better than those who were indulging on more of the, the rich um, indulgences. So just some food for thought, pun intended. I had the privilege to take some students to Ireland as a as part of my academy teaching years. I was the Bible teacher and the music teacher set up this whole music tour for the young people. And I got to go along and tag along with my, uh, with my wife and I, was, I had chaplain duties and so I got to be a part of it and witnessed amazing things and incredible, uh, beautiful nature and the students singing in amazing places. And then at the end, we had witnessed um, downright miracles. At the end, we had a, a debriefing session. Everybody sits in a circle and we're about to head back home. And I should mention that before the trip began, the music teacher announced as being in charge of the trip, he said, you're not bringing your phones. Oh, there was almost a revolution and a revolt among the students when he announced that they were not allowed to have their phones on the trip. This is a mission trip. We're going to be focused on our mission. Well, during the debriefing at the end, they, they spoke of the miracles. They spoke of the amazing things. But you know what the number one thing they said? They, they, a lot, often they were prefacing it with, we don't really want to say this in front of Mr. Ritzema, but because I was kind of the media on the brain guy, embryonic in, in, in development at that point. And they said, we are really gr glad that Mr. K, the music teacher, that, that you didn't require us to, that you required us to not bring our phones, that you didn't let us bring our phones. We are so thankful we didn't have our phones. Can you believe that? We think they're, they're so glued to it, so addicted to it. When you become freed from something and you try something different, you might find a big surprise waiting at the other end. It surprised the young people. It surprised, frankly, surprised the adults that they actually felt that way and shared that at the end. We don't give them enough credit sometimes, do we? Well, we used an analogy at the beginning of the series of a optometrist's office where you go into the appointments and you don't have glasses. You think you're seeing fine, but the, at the end of the little test he gives you, you come out going, oh, wow, I actually can see more clearly with the with the prescription you just put in front of my eyes, really like, okay, so that's the natural eyesight and that one is the prescription. It surprises you when you try it out. So maybe you're thinking about, and if you're not, I want to encourage you to think about a media fast of some kind. In the previous session, we talked about boredom and the Bible. Is your experience with Jesus at peak level or is there some room to grow? And could it possibly be our media choices that are causing some of that smog and haze between us and God that could actually, if we make those media changes, increase our love for and experience of Jesus in our lives? Maybe our pleasure and joy in life is being numbed and muted by the hyper-stimulating, pleasure-seeking culture in which we live. And it's innocent media, maybe. But they did a study in 1954 called the Milner Study. They had mice, and they hooked up to the mouse's brain a little wire that was connected to a lever, and the mouse could tap the lever and literally would send an electrical signal into the nucleus accumbens of the brain where the mouse feels pleasure. And the mouse quickly learned, wow, I tapped that lever and I feel good. That's an easy easy, quick fix way to pleasure. Whoo, yeah. So da di da di da Ooh, I want to go back. Let me go back to the, to the lever. Oh, yeah, that's good. That's good. Now what shall I do? Shall I eat my mouse food? Ah, no, nah, it doesn't taste that good. I just want my lever. Should I run on a wheel and live a normal mouse existence for a little while? No, 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 no. I just want the lever. The mice became totally addicted to the lever, totally consumed with it, and they were literally stop, stopping the consuming of food. They stopped eating their physical nourishment that brought them life. And all they wanted was that lever. What is our physical nourishment that brings us life? The word of God. Are we not consuming that like these rats because we've got something else we're busy with? I'm too busy. Oh, the Bible's kind of dull. Well, that's because we've rewired and malwired our brain into a state of altered and and and. Uh, negativized, that's not a word, it is now, taste buds. Our taste buds seek that which is overstimulating. Well, I have some good news for you. God can rewire our taste buds. I want to quote from a, a publication called Review and Herald, where it speaks of this very thing. We read, If we do not receive the religion of Christ, 
by feeding upon the word of God, we shall not be entitled to an entrance into the city of God. How are we saved? By faith, grace, and faith through Jesus Christ. We have to behold Jesus Christ in his word. If we are not receiving the religion of Christ, salvation by his merits, by feeding upon the word of God, we shall not be entitled to an entrance into the city of God. Having lived on earthly food, having educated our tastes to love worldly things, we would not be fitted for the heavenly courts. We could not appreciate the pure heavenly current that circulates in heaven. The voices of the angels and the music of their harps would not satisfy us. The science of heaven would be as an enigma to our minds. You know what an enigma is? This is people would be transported to heaven who have educated their taste to love the things of the world and they would find it so dull and uninteresting up there it would not satisfy us, we just read. They would find it a mystery. Why do people like it up here? An enigma. Why would anybody like it here, this place? Where are my video games? Where's my, I can't get on my social media. I gotta check my notifications. Where's my entertainment? Again, there's nothing evil necessarily about communicating via smartphones, but is that addiction captivating us to the point where we're losing our taste for the word of God? Now, my wife did a fast from social media for 30 days. She asked me to lock her out of her Facebook account. At the end of that, she said, honey, don't tell me the password. I've been cured of my addiction of, uh, to Facebook and all of the dynamics of negative social, you know, psychological stuff that goes on in there. I'm happier now. We know another mother who uses it in moderation in the morning only. Remember all the questions at what times of day, for what duration of use, uh, and, and, and how frequently. This mother says, I'm committed to only going on there once at one specified location. It's not following me everywhere I go, notifying me and <laughs> interrupting me. I have 30 minutes in the morning, some days if I'm ready, if I've exercised and gotten the day ready for my child, for my homeschool, etc. So maybe you're thinking about a media fast. Now, you've gotten rid of the toxic stuff. You get that out of your house. Remember the story of the pastor and the witch. We don't want that stuff in our house. But are there innocent video games? Let's give it a try. Go without it. Or pick something to say, I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to make a schedule. You know, King Jotham became mighty, the Bible says, because he prepared his ways before the Lord. Prepare the ways before our children, and we do, I want to share with you, scottritzema at gmail.com. I'll walk you through the Dr. Dunkley media fast, the three-week media fast, because we're out of time to really get into all the details of it. But preparing a, something better for those children, a lot of your time and attention, better things, books and Play-Doh and nature, just like Anisha did in her family. And God will give us a, a greater experience with him. It's the promise of his word. We will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. It'll be hard at first, but our joy and mourning will turn, our mourning will turn to joy.